वेलकम टू द शेयर बायोलॉजी पॉडकास्ट वी एट शेयर बायोलॉजी डॉट कॉम मेक साइंस इजी टू कॉम्प्रीहेंड एंड हेल्प पीपल टू गेट अपडेटेड ऑन द न्यू डेवलपमेंट्स इन साइंटिफिक रिसर्च आई एम योर होस्ट शिवरंजनी मोहर अ पोस्ट डॉक्टर फेरो फ्रॉम इंडिया एंड टूडे वी हैव विद अस डॉक्टर केरन जे ओसबॉन फ्रॉम द स्मिथसोनियन नेशनल म्यूजियम ऑफ नेचुरल हिस्ट्री वॉशिंगटन डी सी टू शेयर द सीक्रेट्स ऑफ अल्ट्रा ब्लैक कैमोफ्लाज इन डीप सी फिशेस विच वॉज रिसेंटली पब्लिश्ड इन करंट बायोलॉजी बिफोर वी डेल्व इन टू द डिटेल्स Let us know a little bit about Dr. Karen. Dr. Karen did her BS from Andrews University and MS from Western Washington University. She received her PhD in Integrative Biology from the University of California, Berkeley. She was a postdoc at Scripps Institution of Oceanography at the University of California. Thank you, Karen, for joining us. Uh, now, before we start the discussion on your recent paper. to motivate our young researchers please tell us what inspired you to walk the career as a marine biologist i read that you like to scuba dive and were fascinated with the amount of diversity that existed in the coral reefs so please tell us about it yeah so i grew up in michigan which is in the middle of the united states there's no ocean anywhere nearby um but my father was an avid diver scuba diver and so i got interested in it because of him and then i when i was in college i wanted to travel for a year and all my friends were traveling and going you know all these fancy amazing places and just traveling for fun and i couldn't afford to do that or anything remotely like it so i found a program where i could go and teach um teach school for a year and so i chose uh ponape micronesia which is an island basically halfway between um Guam and Hawaii so out just in the middle of the Pacific and I went there because I knew that it would be really interesting culturally and because um I would be able to scuba dive because yeah it should be warm and gorgeous and everything there and when I I did that I I was struggling my first year of college to figure out what I wanted to do in biology because I I took this big year long biology course um like the hardest one that there was and I thought oh well I'm done with that I'll know which area of biology I'm I'm most into and basically I got through the end of that it's all good maybe um maybe I'm not so into histology and genetics or something but you know everything else is good so I went out there for a year and taught high school um taught biology and art actually and went diving a lot every chance i got and was just completely blown away by the animals on the reef just all these shapes and sizes and colors that i had never seen before and just was completely amazed right because they're all basically trying to do the same thing right they're trying to reproduce they're trying to find something to eat and they're trying not to be eaten but they're doing it in all these different ways and i found that diversity really intriguing and i wanted to um i mean basically then i said i want to study strange animals and that's still <laughs> that's still what i'm doing and figuring out how they how they survive and how they live and and how they do you know all the different things that they do and so that was that was the start and i came back from that year of teaching and um did took every biology class i could find that was related to organisms or animals and um yeah then just have been pursuing that ever since amazed that people pay me to do this really <laughs> yeah that's interesting so can we say that you turned your hobby into your profession or career path yeah yeah for sure so you must be yeah you must be really motivated to do whatever you are doing i am um, i like like to do it all the time but i have also lots of other things i like to do too so it gets a little bit <laughs> so, a little <laughs> so everything comes with a package <laughs> yeah Yeah. yeah. Okay, so now let us come to the actual topic of discussion, your research paper Ultra Black Camouflage in Deep Sea Fishes. Please tell us the background about this work. Um yeah, so I studied I did a master's looking at the diversity of a project that let me learn all different groups of invertebrate. Um and I really enjoyed that, but I I did a internship actually at a deep sea research institute in California and immediately fell in love with the deep sea and just the immensity of the things we don't know about the deep sea right there's so much out there that we really you know you see an animal and sometimes i would ask my you know supervisors and the people were there when i was an intern like what is that and they would say don't know 
sometimes we see things we don't even know what phylum they belong to, right? So um, to me, that was really exciting because I had done my master's in intertidal biology where we kind of I mean, basically knew or at least seemed like we knew everything and we were doing this, you know, tweaking experiments to learn a little bit more each time. Whereas in the deep sea, there's, you know, we don't know what the animals are. We don't know what they eat. We don't know how they survive. We don't know how long they live. You know, there's so many questions. It just seemed like there was so many opportunities there to make a contribution that I just got hooked on the deep sea. So I've been doing that ever since um, and very lucky to have found a way to do it, right? Because it's kind of expensive to do these these types of research. Yeah. Where there's a will, there's a way. Yeah. Um, and so... <laughs> So um, I started working on, I mostly work actually on worms and crustaceans, as you can tell from my title, but I, my supervisor for my PhD actually worked on fishes. And so I still go out to sea with him periodically, like we, uh, midwater biology or deep sea biology is very collaborative, right? So somebody has time on a ship and with a vehicle and we all kind of, you know, you and you take your people and then you invite more people to come along. Um, to work on whatever you find because it's very, it's very, you never know what you're going to find, right? You might be going out there looking for a particular animal or to see some particular thing and maybe you see it and maybe you don't, but you're guaranteed to see something that's interesting, right? So you want to have a big group of people that work on different things so that you can make the most of what you do find. Um, I was on a cruise with him and I had been thinking about the surfaces of animals so midwater is the open ocean, hmm. um, the deep part of the open ocean, right? So it's not near the surface. It's far away from shore. It's not near the seafloor. It's all that water below the surface and above the seafloor. So, you know, like average depth of the ocean is 4,000 meters. That is a huge amount of space, hmm. right? And we kind of tend to forget about the animals that are there. Um, but there's a huge diversity of animals there. So we were out exploring that. One important thing for animals that live there is that there's nowhere to hide, right? There's no seaweed, there's no coral reef, there's no rocks, there's nothing out there. So it's very important to be able to hide basically in plain sight out there. In the shallower water, that is often done by being transparent. Um, and if you're transparent, that's great. The light passes right through you and things can't see you. The problem is that if crustaceans especially, they have an exoskeleton, right? And the exoskeleton is made out of chitin, and that has a different refractive index than water. And so when light passes through water and hits that chitin, it's from a certain angle, it's going to bounce off. It's not going to pass straight through. Okay. So we were studying these crustaceans that have um, anti-reflective films on them, just like on a camera lens or something. And so I was thinking about the surfaces of animals and what the surface does to the light and, and things. And I was on this expedition with my um, previous supervisor, Bruce Robeson, and he collected a fish, which is not something we do very often with the remotely operated vehicle, because most of the time the fish can get away from us. They're much faster. <laughs> They're much faster than the vehicle. But in this case, we actually managed to catch one, and it was a fang tooth, which is a really cool, you know, one of these quintessential deep sea fish uh, with the big teeth and, you know, and I was looking at its skin and I, I got really interested in what was going on with its skin because I had tried to take pictures of deep sea fish before and usually I just get these really horrible pictures of silhouettes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you can see the eye, but for most of the fish, you just get this silhouette. And I have a very fancy camera system, right? So my, my startup at the museum, I got to buy this really nice camera. And um, usually I can take a picture of just about anything. So I was really frustrated that I couldn't get photographs of these things. So I asked one of my friends who works on camouflage in the deep sea and um, optics and how light interacts with things. And I asked him, I said, Sanka, how do, how do black fish, how do they make themselves so black? Because it doesn't seem to matter how much light, you know, I can use four flashes and all the light disappears, right? They just suck it all, all up completely. They're so amazing. And he said, oh, I don't know. Nobody's ever looked. We... Um, they're, we just assume they have lots and lots of pigment or something there, but we've never looked at that. And so I said, oh, well, that's interesting. Maybe we should, maybe we should take a look. So I started taking um, skin samples 
from fish that were being collected for other projects um, by other researchers. And so that's part of why it took a long time, right? Because I would just, whenever I was out on a cruise and we would get a fish that was black, I would take some skin samples, take it back to the museum, look at it under the microscope, do, a, do some scanning electron microscopy and things like that. And I started to notice a pattern that we were seeing very similar arrangement of pigment in the skin in all of these different fishes. And what I find so interesting about this project is that we've sampled 16 different groups of fishes all across the diversity of fishes, right? There's deep sea representatives from many of the fish groups that we know of. And every single one of them arranges their skin pigment in the same way. And it's very different than how most fish have skin pigment. And so I kept pushing Sanka, who's the mathematician and the biophysicist. I kept pushing him like, look, there's something going on here with their skin, right? This is not normal. It's not that just that they have a whole bunch of pigment out there and it's, it's able to absorb all the light, but something is going on. So can you model something or do some, you know, some kind of fancy math? I am not a math person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, do something, you know, do some modeling and figure out what's going on with these particles. There has to be a reason that they're all the same size and shape and the way that they're packing them in there. And so it took a couple of years for him to play around with a couple of different ideas, kind of always, you know, it's, this has always been a side project. Not either of us what we normally do. It's just kind of this little hobby on the side. And um, after a couple of years, he said, oh, I've got it. that. Like, I looked at a bunch of modeling of how they looked at why the moon is so reflective and the size of the particles on the moon and how they're packed together and stuff. And he figured out um, this nice model so that we could look at them and figured out that the size of the particles of pigment in their skin are just the right size and just the right shape and packed together in just the right way so that they are super efficient at absorbing all the light. So those particles are made out of melanin, which is the same pigment that we have in our skin and our hair and birds have in their feathers and everything. So it's that same pigment melanin, and it's packaged into small granules called melanosomes. And those melanosomes are a little bit bigger than most animals, and they're more capsule shaped, so they're kind of elongate instead of being spheres. And then they're packed in together in layers that are about five microns thick. And what that does is basically the light comes in, and any light that's not immediately absorbed would normally be reflected back either either back where it came from or um, in some other direction forward, and it would bounce around a little bit and then it would be seen. But in this case, what the shape and the packing of those particles is just right so that any light that's reflected off of them goes sideways. And they have this very thin layer of all these particles. So if you can keep the light in that thin layer, then it's gonna all get absorbed before it goes out. Um, and that's, particularly exciting and interesting because ultra black materials are really, um, they're really useful. They're used in like high power telescopes and camera lenses, solar panels and things like that. Anywhere they wanna make sure there's no light bouncing around where it's not supposed to be. Um, but they're really expensive to make those materials because you have to basically make a physical light trap, something that keeps the light trapped so that the pigment can absorb all of it. And usually that means some kind of structure. So like butterfly wings, they have these really cool little box shaped things where the light goes in, it kind of bounces around inside that box until it's all absorbed by the pigment underneath it. But what these guys have done is they've gotten rid of that whole structure to trap light and they just use the pigment granules themselves, the shape of the granules to keep the light in with all the pigment and absorbing them. So it's a really simple system much simpler than than all the other systems that we know of, whether they're man-made or in animals. Yeah, that's interesting. It's really interesting. Another question is, are there any specific spots or locations on the body of the fish where the area is more, uh, is darker or it's dark overall? Uh, it depends on the fish. That's a great question. Many of the fishes have bioluminescence as well. Bioluminescence uh, is light produced by other animals or, or other organisms. It can be bacteria as well. Often it's bacteria. And in the deep sea, in the midwater, 
something like 85%, maybe 86% of the animals that are there produce light of some sort, right? So it's very different than on land. Many of the, it's, it's more the rule that they produce light than, than the exception, like it is up here on land. Um, so there's a lot of bioluminescent light, and that is the light that this uh, ultra black camouflage is really effective against because there's fishes down there that are hunting using searchlights to find things. And if you think about what the background is there, the background view is complete blackness, right? Because it's maybe a little bit of bioluminescence here or there. But if you can match that blackness, then you have great camouflage. Another way that people animals use bioluminescence is when they feel threatened, like if a predator is nearby or, you know, takes a bite at them, release bioluminescence to try to light up that predator so that something bigger will see it and come and eat it, right, before it finishes eating them. And so that's another case where being black is great, right, because that, that bioluminescent light that's meant to light you up doesn't do it. And then the third case is many of these animals have bioluminescence themselves, and so they have like a lure that they hang out in front of themselves and they light it up. But think about that. If you have most of these animals have these huge teeth and eyes and, you know, they're really awful looking. Right. But if you were to hang a street <laughs> lamp in front of this big, ugly face right, and you want little little things to swim in and, and eat it. Right. And they're obviously visual things if they're coming towards the light, then they're going to see this big, ugly face and, and just not come anywhere near you. Right. So if they're ultra black you can hang a light right in front of yourself and they won't be able to see you. So there's a lot of different ways to do it. So we do see on different fishes, we see different parts of the body being ultra black. Some of them, the entire body, like several angler fish, there's many fish where the entire body is ultra black. Even their fins and everything are covered with this pigment. But we also see many fishes, different types of fishes that have like their belly is ultra black because they eat bioluminescent things. And while you're digesting something that's bioluminescent, it tends to glow. And you really don't want to run around with a big glowing belly in a place where you want to be dark. Uh, yeah. And many of the animals, yeah, many of the animals that have photophores, they will put a bunch of ultra black material around that photophore so that they can control where the light goes, right? They want the light to only go straight down. So they put a, all this black material around it so that it doesn't go other directions and light them up. Yeah. So my next question is, could you see any bi a symbiotic relationship of any bioluminescent bacteria with the fish that you, uh, with the specimen that you got? There probably is, but I don't know. Well, we didn't pay much attention to the bioluminescent stuff other than looking at the patterns of where the pigment was in relation to their bioluminescent organs. But like some of them, make the bioluminescence themselves and some of them culture you know they have a bunch of bacteria in an organ that makes the light for them um, but we didn't pay much attention to to that interaction for this project yeah so being dark and being transparent could be two ways of hiding from either the prey or predator so uh, which one do you think would be more efficient or do you think the depth of ocean at which the organism is there would decide which one would work better for that? Yeah, so you've nailed it there with, you've answered your own question. <laughs> oh, I'm learning very biology from you. <laughs> so the, the, we, tend to see, um, we tend to see transparent animals up in the very shallow water where there's a lot of light. So up where there's still sunlight coming down because then when you're up in shallow water and there's light reflecting all around off the particles in the water, the light is coming from all different directions. And so being transparent is incredibly effective then because it's very hard to mesh with the background because the background is changing depending on which angle you're looking at it from, right? right. Um, right. Being black up in the shallow water is really not good because you stand out like a sore thumb. You're just, <laughs> everything <laughs> can see you. Um, but many of these fish that are ultra black, they, um, they actually migrate up into shallow water at night and so okay. being black, uh, ultra black for them up there is, it's a problem. And that's when we see them having photophores on themselves because most of the predation happens from below. And so you've got light coming down from above and you've got a black animal and a, another animal looking up trying to see its shadow. And a black animal makes a great shadow, right? Mm, right. So they have usually photophores underneath themselves 
so that they can mask, they can make light to match the light that's coming down from above. Okay. So researchers are just starting to look at how they match that light. And there's certain, some in some fishes, there's particular parts of their eye that are, that all they, all they do is look at what's the ambient light and then they can control their bioluminescence to match it, uh, which I just think is, is so cool. It is. So the fish which you got, whether they are preys or predators, are of intermediate size. Another question is, if a prey evolves to get darker, I suppose a predator also would find ways of finding its prey. In that scenario, what do you think would the predator do to find its prey? Well, there's all kinds of interesting ways that that fishes and other predators down there are, you know, kind of doing this arms race, right, to be able to find things because there just isn't that much food out in the deep sea, right? That all they're either dependent on chemosynthesis, you know, from the bottom, and that has to be really close to the bottom, or you're waiting for this food to rain down, you know, from productivity at the surface. And so there's so many interconnections between food webs there, right? Uh, so many things eat whatever they find. And many of the fishes that we see here, one of the fishes that we measured for this is called the black swallower. And they actually will eat fish the same size or bigger than themselves. They really are the nastiest fish ever. I mean, we had one that was perfectly happy and healthy in a bowl that we had collected with the ROV one time. And it was just, anytime you would like move the bowl or put anything in there to try to move the direction, it would just snap at you. And it was just like, you can tell they just, anything that comes near, they just eat it right up. But there are some really cool adaptations. Eyes of deep sea fish, right? This is not my area, but I've heard enough from my colleagues. There's all these really cool adaptations to really be able to see like almost single photons in the deep sea, pick out patterns and things like that with these really incredibly well adapted eyes. There also are, you know, fishes that use red light to hunt with. Nothing in the deep sea except for these fishes can see red light because it's okay. just not a wavelength down there, right? Mm -hmm. And so there, there's all these cool different ways that different animals are figuring out, you know, just, just getting that little bit of an advantage okay. to be able to find some food or to take advantage of the food when they do find it. Yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah, life would find its way. Yeah. So, so are there any specific stages of development or age at which they are darker than other stages or they are ultra dark throughout? Is anything known about that? Yeah, that's a really interesting question and one that we were not able to address with this project. But I think it would be really interesting to to look at that on some of these fishes because surely at least many, I don't know about the specific species that we looked at here, but all, oftentimes the larvae or the younger stages occur in shallower water, right? Where there's more food. At least a few of them are transparent when they're young. And then at some point, right, they transition into deeper water and they become more pigmented and, and things like that. I mean, pigment is a very dynamic system. Melanin is, is a really incredible molecule, one that we don't even know the structure of really yet. I mean, we have some ideas of it, but okay. if you ask someone what the structure of melanin is, they can give you some ideas, but they really, they don't actually know. And there's a bunch of different kinds of it. Oh. But it's a little bit toxic because it's a really strong redox chemical. And so it's packaged inside these melanosomes. So it's in its own little vacuole, right? Mm. And, and then those vacuoles, so those melanosomes are made in melanocytes. And then they're transferred from the melanocytes into keratinocytes. And then the keratinocytes migrate out to whatever layer of the skin they're going to go to. In an ultra black fish, they go right out to the very outer surface, which is a really unusual part. Usually the, the pigmented cells are down deeper in like the dermal layers. Mm. But in the ultra black fish, they're right at the surface of the dermis and the epidermis is highly reduced. So there's not really anything in between them. You know, they can change these things quite easily, which is I think how we can account for 16 or more times the same mechanism of making themselves ultra black has evolved because all the all the fishes have the same mechanism of making pigment for their skin. It's just a matter of how much pigment you make and where you move those cells to. And it's something that's constantly changing, right? So one of these fish, it's very easy to actually damage that black 
out of service because there's nothing there to protect it, right? So if you, another fish comes along and takes a swipe at them, they will scrape it off. And it'll be, it would be really interesting also to see how long it takes for them to recover that because underneath the black is all this collagen, like all the structure that's in their skin and collagen is super highly reflective. So when these guys get damaged, they suddenly have this really, really bright, really reflective spot on them for who knows how long, right? Probably they can replace it pretty quickly, but, but we don't know. That brings to uh, the next question. So have you tried to keep these fish in laboratory conditions at the ambient temperatures? and have seen the whether the coloration decreases or whether the external conditions affect the pigmentation? We haven't. It would be interesting to do that because oftentimes they do come up in really good condition, hmm. especially when we collect them with the remotely operated vehicles or the submersibles. Hmm. But we, have, we don't usually try to keep things in the lab unless we have a particular experiment or something that we're trying to do. Hmm. But we do um, see that in many other animals. So the crustaceans that I work on are hyperid amphipods, and we see them, they come up and they're really dark red sometimes. Because there's no red light in the deep sea, red effectively is the same thing as black. So a lot of the crustaceans and the worms and the, and the squid and things, they're red instead of black, but effectively it's the same thing. So we see these crustaceans, they come up and they're really dark red. And then we work on them in the lab for a little while and they get lighter and lighter and lighter. And by the time, you know, an hour or two passes, they're completely transparent. Oh. And it's really cool to look at the cells that control that. So it's the keratinocytes and they look like a, a mesh, right? Or some kind of a, like this web sticking out cell. And the pigment is in there and they're just like cephalopod skin, right? Cephalopod skin is so cool, right? They have neural control. They can pull all the pigment into a teeny tiny little dot or they can spread it out really quickly and they have a bunch of different colors of it. So these crustaceans can do the same thing. They're just a lot slower about it, right? So they can, they can slowly decrease the light. So when they're in light, they want to be transparent. When they're in the deep sea, they want to be dark and highly pigmented. And so probably the fish would, I, I, my guess would be that you're correct. And if you were to keep them in the light, if they survive, that they would probably reduce the amount of pigment that they have. Because it's quite expensive, I think, to, to maintain this. Yes, that's true. So the, does the thickness of the layers matter for reflectance? Or does it have, like you said, it is of 0.5, uh, it's of 5 micron or something? Something like that. 5 or 0.5, I missed it. Yeah, I don't remember. Actually, so don't quote me on that. <laughs> it's one or the other. Anyway, 5 something. Um, it's not very thick, though. It's, very, it's really thin, um, the layer. So there are different thicknesses in different fishes of that layer. And only up to a certain point does it make a difference on how effective they are. Once you get past um, whatever that is, five micron, I should look it up for you. Um, once you get past that thickness, it doesn't matter. Uh, the layer doesn't have to be very thick for it to work really effectively. So... Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, so this reflectance is lower than the blackest known animals. Just to give a perspective, how can it be compared with any man-made material? Can you just give an example that this man-made material is this dark, something like that? So the best, the blackest man-made material that I know of is Vanta Black, which is made by Surrey Nanosystems in somewhere in England. And basically it's a set of, they grow carbon nanotubules and it looks like a carpet, right? They just pack all these nanotubules together and the light goes in and it bounces around in these tubules, right? And it never comes out. And that is 0.05% of light reflected back. And we had one of the anglerfish was indeed that black as well. So they're as black as Vanta black for blue and green light, which is so cool because that's what most of the bioluminescence is, that's out there is blue and green wavelengths. And so it's really cool that they've, not only are they super black, but they're super black in the particular wavelengths that are important to them. But Vanta Black, yeah, Vanta Black is a really cool material, but it's super expensive. Like we tried to get a piece of it so that we could calibrate our, spect <laughs> our spectrometer so we could be sure that our reflectances we were measuring were, were good. 
and believable. And it, it's something, it's not, it's really expensive and it's really delicate material, right? So those nanotubules, like if you touch it, you brush your finger across it, you've just like decimated that whole streak there. So the fish are not that fragile, which is cool. So this uh, dark color and minimum reflection of light, you think has implication in prey predator relationship. Uh, so at deep oceans where there is very less light, apart from visual cues, are there any other cues which uh, govern communication between the same species? Are uh, like what all other cues are there apart from the visual one? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So a lot of the deep sea fishes, if you look at their um, their faces, oftentimes and down their bodies, right? So they have. Many of them have a lateral line system so that they can feel the water movement, right? So it's a it's a um, touch system, a mechanical sensory system. Um, but if you look at the faces of many of the deep sea fishes, they have all these really amazing pores and sensory structures all over their faces. As they're swimming, it pushes the water through these channels and they have chemosensory um, sensors in there. They have mechanosensory sensors in there. So. In the deep sea where it's completely black, you have a couple different options, right? You can either make really good eyes and maybe make some light to help you see, or you can say, okay, forget it. I'm not going to mess with eyes. I'm just going to smell my way around the world and have really good sense, you know, chemosensory structures. And many of them do that. Or you can say, look, I'm just going to feel everything out there has to move at some point, And I'm going to focus on eating things that move. And so I'm just going to feel things near me. Um, oftentimes, there's some combination of all of those things, right? But there are a few fishes that just have these incredible um, chemosensory structures and pits and all channels to make the water, you know, kind of concentrate smells and stuff for them. And it's really cool. So they definitely are other, other ways to do things than visual predators. But considering how dark the habitat is, it's really amazing how many animals still retain eyes because eyes are incredibly expensive tissue to maintain and nervous, nervous tissue to translate that information and stuff too. It's all be, like some of the most energetically expensive tissue to maintain. So if um, like, for example, the crustaceans I work on, I work on them because they have amazing eyes, like sometimes 35% of their body is eye. Oh. Um, and so they're dedicating a huge amount of energy to building and maintaining these eyes so that they can see and that's, you know, that's an interesting, interesting mm. choice. I mean, it's not a choice on the individual's part, but like evolutionarily, that lineage has gone in that direction. So that, you know, vision, they're really depending on vision for everything. Um, and so it's interesting to see those trade-offs in the deep sea where there's not a lot of energy to be had. And so everything is really, really tight, right? And I think that's why we got this ultra black material. They are making themselves ultra black. They're using the least amount of material and the cheapest material they can make, you know, so that they can use as little energy as possible to to be um, effective in the camouflage. What about the size of the eyes of the, the fishes which you got, the ultra black fish? Oh, well, it depends. Some of them have not really a continuum. There's you either have big eyes that work well or you kind of forget about your eyes, right? So like the black swallow has this huge mouth and this huge extendable belly and these little tiny beady eyes. So it's probably just smelling its way around the world, which is interesting. And another thing that I find interesting is that smell and, you know, for us, smell and taste are very different things. But in the ocean, smell and taste are the same thing, right? It's all chemosensory stuff. So you're just, you know, it, yeah, it, it's, it, they're completely commingled, those things. And it's very useful because the ocean is actually really structured and most of these animals are quite small, right? So the water is not the way that we experience it, right? It's not this big, viscous, everything mixing kind of place. It's very viscous. So it's kind of like swimming through honey. And so if there's a particle that swung through, right? That scent trail is, a, is quite a distinct trail that they can usually follow through this viscous liquid and track down you know that that particle or their animal or whatever that was there so it's a really not an intuitive thing for us to think about right because we live at such a different scale than the animals down there yeah right right so this low reflectance of light can be taken as maximum absorption of light 
by the animals so do you think these fish have any specific advantage because of which they absorb the maximum light so some people have asked me something similar and i really don't know the answer but they've said you know okay if they're absorbing all this light wouldn't that be generating some heat for them heat exactly bit, right yeah yeah i mean it may um if it's like a really big bioluminescence or something like that but it's so cold down there right it's the temperature of our refrigerators like two to four degrees celsius it's really cold and so there's so little light that i can't imagine it would make much of a difference to them but who knows other things that could be really interesting so melanin is this really cool chemical and it actually absorbs all kinds of radiation not just visual light but also lots of really harmful types of radiation so under the dome at chernobyl there's a fungus that grows that's completely black that uses melanin to absorb energy from the radioactivity and that's what the fungus grows on so it's growing under this you know giant cement dome with no light no nothing it's just using the radioactivity that's there and the melanin to harness that um, to grow and so they melanin absorbs all kinds of um, all kinds of energy it also absorbs all kinds of toxic um, chemicals it's a really strong redox reagent so if you have an outer layer of this stuff on you then that also can be serving to protect them from you know toxic chemicals that they may encounter or any different kinds of things that they could encounter which is kind of interesting when you think about um, if you wanted to to create a material like this using melanin and use it for like camouflage for humans, right? For like, you know, protective gear or something. Um, not only would you be making yourself a nice camouflage for doing things at night, but um, you'd also be protecting yourself from chemical weapons or from radioactive weapons or things like that, which is a really interesting idea. I generally stay as far away as I can from military things, but I was like, okay, if we can protect our soldiers from, you know, <laughs> like that, that's a, that's a nice, that's a nice idea. So, yeah. So there are two applications probably of these ultra black fish. One is like you said, generating ultra black surfaces and the other could be this energy, like the light, since it is absorbing maximum light, it can yeah. store it in the form of heat energy or store as in, yeah, yeah, store, we can say. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You, it, I'm it, sure it has to, right? The energy has to go somewhere. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay. One quick question. It might not be related to this study. So how deep have you gone under an ocean? <laughs> like, <laughs> um, yeah, so I mostly have used, so when I scuba dive, I don't usually go past a hundred feet or like 30, 30 ish meters. Um, mm -hmm. But in the submersible, I've gone, it goes down to 400 meters. Wow, 400 meters. Before I was a graduate student, I went on the Johnson Sea Link, which was a submersible um, previously, and that one goes down to 1,000 meters. So we didn't get that deep on, on my death, but okay. I don't remember. Yeah, but 400 is still very impressive. You would have like got the whole flavor of under ocean life. Absolutely. It's really interesting to sit in there. And this particular submersible, the Yago, has a big dome window about, a, I don't know, like two or three, like almost a meter, I think, in width. And it has a similar dome on top. And so you can, as you're going down, you're kind of going too fast to be able to look out the front. and But you can look out the top dome and see the light just fade as you go. And where I've done that work was in off of Cape Verde. Uh, where the water is really, really clear, right? And it was amazing to me how quickly the light that my eyes could see disappeared, right? So within a few um, tens of meters, it it was quite dark. Um, but, and, and I was a little worried about going in them, right? They're very small spaces. You've got a lot of water around <laughs> you, you know. Um, so do you have you any, <laughs> like any companion? Or you just yeah, go yeah. alone in... <laughs> No, no, thank goodness this is, there's a pilot in there who knows what he's doing, right? And he's yeah. used to managing us crazy scientists who come down and are just like so excited and, and interested in this. But I was so excited to see things not through a camera, but with my own eyes 
that I really, I never even thought about all the other, you know, I don't know, things that could go wrong or, you know, whatever, because it was just so cool to to be able to look out and see with your own eyes. It's a very different experience. Yeah, different so experience in itself. Yeah. Yeah, we can do so many things with the remotely operated vehicles. We can go deeper, we can stay longer, we can collect more stuff um, because you really don't have to have all that life support material and everything. Um, but there's something about seeing it yourself, right? And actually watching the interactions and you can turn the lights off and our eyes can see all the bioluminescence and everything happening, but can't, cameras that can see that are really expensive. And so we've only just gotten that in the last several years, but it was really cool to just turn all the light. At one point we had to turn the lights off because there were so many animals attracted to the light. So we couldn't really see anything out there. They were just krill and, and hyperids all swarming around the front. And so we turned all the lights off completely. And then we watched them all bioluminesce as they dispersed away from the submersible. And it was, it was just amazing to be able to see all of that activity and stuff with your own eyes. Dr. Karen, thanks for taking us to the depths of the ocean to experience the secrets of deep sea life. It felt surreal. Since we are at the end of the podcast, we would like to conclude this episode with your message to the young researchers. Yeah. So I, when I did my undergrad, you know, uh, study, I remember how we were taught biology, which is, you know, kind of, you can, you can look up the answers to a lot of different things. Right. Um, and I didn't really find it that inspiring because it seemed like it felt like we knew everything, right. Which is obviously not the case. Right. And we, we know that the pandemic is really bringing that home, like really strongly. Um, but, but I think it's really important to instill in students that there is so much to learn and so many interesting things that we just don't understand and we don't know about. Um, and that is most clear in like the deep ocean because there's so many things, you know, I, I give talks a lot of different places to a lot of different audiences and I always get really wonderful questions and most of the time I can't answer half of them. Not always because I don't know the answers, but just because they, we don't know, right? We don't know what these animals eat. We don't know how they survive. We don't know how long they live. We don't know what cool things they are doing that we could, you know, learn from to make, um, to make something that would make our lives better, right? And so I think it's really important that we um, continue to make it possible to do exploratory science, right? Where you're just out there looking and seeing what makes you curious, what makes you ask questions. And that for students, I think is the most important thing, right? That they ask questions and that they, um, they realize that they can make a difference. There's so much, so much to learn and so much to contribute. Dr. Karen, it was a pleasure to have you as a guest and we look forward to the opportunity to do so again. Thank you guys so much for the invitation. Good luck. Well, listeners, we hope you too vicariously experience the life at the depth of oceans. And if you like our work, please subscribe to sharebiology.com for more podcasts in the future.